Hello, and welcome to DW Fast Track, where lawyers discuss the hottest topics and trends in the legal industry. I'm today's host, Marlene Cantrelli, a member in Dickinson Wright's Phoenix office focusing on family law and divorce. In this episode, we are joined by industry expert Bob Schwartz, another member here in Phoenix, to discuss divorcing a narcissist. Thank you, Marlene. This is Bob Schwartz, and I'm happy to be here with you. I think it's important, though, for people to understand before we get into the particulars of this topic that we are attorneys. We're not psychologists. We're not psychiatrists. We're not mental health professionals. But what we are are two attorneys who combined probably have well in excess of 50 years of dealing with uh, divorces, types of problems that we see that arise when we're dealing with the narcissistic spouse. Could it, be, it can be the husband, it can be the, uh, the wife. People should bear in mind that, that we're not offering medical opinions. We're just talking about our personal experiences and our observations over the years. Right, Bob. And in particular, talking today about narcissism and tips for divorcing a narcissist and how we do that. Because as you know, we hear that term a lot, but seldom do we ever take time to explore exactly what that means and the kind of narcissistic personalities that exist that make divorces especially difficult. But there certainly are some things that can be done to ensure that the narcissist does not take control of the case and the courtroom. True, Marlene. And when you've been in practice for as long as we have, you've seen the behaviors that narcissist, that the narcissist attempts to use. Uh, but understanding the narcissist behaviors and the different types of narcissists helps us to be able to recognize it from the beginning. Otherwise, it's too late. Also important to recognize that people may exhibit narcissistic traits, even if they're not officially diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. So, Bob, what are some of the traits that you have seen? Well, it's interesting, just a little bit of history. Remember the Greek myth of Narcissus. He fell in love with his reflection in a pool of water, but ultimately could love no one else and fell into a state of despair. Uh, The same is true here. The narcissist has an inflated sense of self-importance and is in constant need of admiration and attention from others. The world revolves around them. Yes, it's true. And it it reflects itself in traits that include selfishness, a lack of empathy, and really the inability to form deep bonds, all of which make for a recipe for divorce, which is why I see a lot of narcissistic behaviors in our cases. Uh, What we seem to see are three types of narcissists, which makes it difficult sometimes to spot who is who. There is, of course, the overt narcissist. That's the person which is easier to spot, and we usually know them from the start. They are overly confident. They want to be the center of attention. They're obsessed with power and money and can never be wrong. And then on the opposite end of that, there's the covert narcissist. That, you know, is the person who appears charming to others, but in reality, they lack empathy for others they can't form deep bonds and attachments. They have this sense of entitlement that others do not matter. They'll resist change and they may actually give their partner the silent treatment to punish them because they know what hurts their partners, they just don't care. And this kind of abuse has damaging effects, both physical and emotional on their partner and the children. And then there are those individuals who have officially been diagnosed diagnosed as narcissistic personality disorder. It's one of several different types of personality disorders recognized in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM-5. The only way that you can really say a person is clinically a narcissist is if they have been diagnosed as such by a mental health professional. And and Bob, that DSM-5 is important because that's what is used by many mental health professionals to diagnose not only this disorder, but other disorders as well. That's true. And this disorder causes significant personality traits that affect their social and family life, including a belief that one is special and will only associate with others of the same status. There's a constant need for affirmation and praise. They'll exploit others for personal gain, 
it sets a terrible example for their children. You know, you're right about the children because the children are victims of all of this. Because when you lack empathy for others, it's hard to have empathy then even for your children and what they're going through. And that's the life you've been raised in. It's really hard for them to form bonds. Again, as we've said, they have this sense of entitlement and they expect special treatment. But you know, Bob, what I find is interesting is that when you talk to their partners, they often try to reel them in by what I'll refer to as love bombing them. They'll show excessive love and affection and admiration. And there could have been this silent treatment given or any number of um, self-admiration or this self-confidence that's given or the gaslighting that you mentioned. But by the same token, then they go ahead and they show this excessive love, affection and admiration. So maybe talk about a little bit about that gaslighting that you and I talked about in the past. Well, that's true. That seems to be common with the narcissist, that they gaslight their spouse. They'll never apologize. They'll never make themselves out to be wrong. As a matter of fact, they are the victims, Marlene. They're the ones who, no matter what the issue involved, become the victim and not the doer. So much so that the partner is often left being the one apologizing and feeling guilty for the behavior that the other spouse engaged in. It's, it's a very complex and a very difficult relationship to live through. Uh, we hear from spouses all the time that uh, they can never be the one that apologizes, that the other spouse is always right, that their entire relationship has been based on them having to kowtow to their partner. So let's talk a little bit maybe about how we handle that narcissist in court, because oftentimes we do try to settle before going to court. But then the question is, how do you settle with a narcissist in family court? Because as you and I both know, the problem is the narcissist loves court. They believe they are smarter than everyone else, their spouse, the other attorney, their own attorney, and even the judge. So there's this feeling by them that they're just going to waltz in and tell everyone how it is and how they are particularly good at it because we know they can be charming and convincing and talk with authority. It's also what makes the other spouse so afraid about going to court because they know they are going to be good in court. And so oftentimes we'll have clients tell us, I don't want to go to court because I know they're going to be charming in court. I know the judge is going to believe them because that's what they've seen and what they've lived. Uh, you know, Marlene, over the years, we've seen this many times where our client says, uh, I'll lose in court. He's too smart. He's too clever. He's too tricky. He'll charm the judge. They'll believe him. They'll be made out to be a person who created all the problems. So sometimes it's very helpful if we can get that party's attorney to help us settle the case. Other lawyers have dealt with the same types of issues as uh, we have over the years. So they know that personality. And if you get the right attorney on the other side, it can be very helpful in settling the case. Well, I think there's some specific tips that we might be able to give people for trying to settle with a narcissist because one of the most important things is, I think, you have to resist the urge to be bullied. The narcissist wants to take control of the situation and keep their spouse from seeking the advice of others. And oftentimes they're even told before the filing of even a petition for dissolution of marriage or before retaining and discussing the matter with a lawyer, that if this matter can be resolved now, they're willing to give you all these things in the divorce. And then they'll threaten you that if you insist on seeing a lawyer and not accepting the proposal, they will not be so generous. The problem with that is that such an approach gives you no idea of whether the offer is good or bad, but you also know you want to avoid confrontation because that could cost you thousands of dollars in the long run from what you might be entitled to receive. So in such cases, I always recommend avoid the confrontation, but also avoid the outright rejection of the proposal. Instead, listen to the proposal, thank them for the offer, but advise them that you're going to feel much more comfortable consulting with your legal counsel and getting back to them. You have to keep the approach direct, avoid the escalation, because making those rash decisions because of fear that the law may not be so generous as you've been told by your soon-to-be ex-spouse 
is rarely a good approach. Another point that I think people need to keep in mind is that it's imperative that they set up healthy boundaries. One of the things that seems to come up all the time is that the narcissist tries to get the other party to distrust their attorney. It's a common trick. It happens over and over again. Your lawyer is only out to fleece you. Your lawyer doesn't know what they're doing. Your lawyer doesn't know what they're talking about. So it's important to understand that this is just part of their strategy, part of the game, and part of how they're going to try and take control of the entire situation. So when we talk about setting up healthy boundaries, it's important even more so when dealing with the narcissist. During a divorce, the narcissist will often attempt to start conversations with you, uh, whether they're by text, email, phone, or in person, about the issues in the divorce in an attempt to justify their position and to force a resolution that may not be in your best interest. You need to set limits in terms of the issues to be discussed. I will only talk to you about medical emergencies. I will only talk to you about exchange times with the children. You need to set up methods of communication. I will only communicate with you by email. I will only communicate with you by text. You need to be able to proceed in a less stressful manner. But the most important thing is if you're going to set up boundaries, you need to stick to them. It's so true. And I don't know how many times have you heard where people come in and say, yeah, he says that my lawyer is better or that I shouldn't trust you. You're not giving me good legal advice. And it's all just part of that narcissistic traits that we have seen. And, and I think another important thing is if you're going to conduct settlement negotiations, be mindful of how to do that. Because many divorces involving a narcissist do end up going to trial. But as you said, we want to try to get things settled. That would be the best way to try to resolve things. But, you know, we're talking about issues of alimony and property division and child support and parenting time. So with a narcissist, even when the law appears clear, it's difficult to settle with them. Because even though the law may not necessarily support the position of the narcissist, that does not keep the narcissist from believing they are right. And this is partially true because they are generally that charismatic, outgoing, successful in their business dealings. So it's hard for them to believe that any judge would rule against them until a judge renders a ruling that has to be followed. So a few of the things that I have found to be helpful is to be realistic in what you want and what's important and make those items the focal point of your negotiations. Listen to your spouse without being judgmental or pushing back because we know that's only going to aggravate them. So in a way, we're playing a little bit of their game, but keeping in mind that it's to get ultimately what you want. And then to the extent we can reinforce whatever positive behaviors of your spouse during the negotiations. Again, remembering they like that affirmation. They want that admiration. And so to the extent we're playing that game, we're doing it for a specific purpose. Well, Marlene, you're exactly right. So a few other things you might want to have to consider when talking about settlement is to avoid criticizing their behavior. The narcissist gets very upset when they're told they're wrong, when they're told that their approach is not the proper approach. Don't take anything personally. There's going to be a lot of emotion. There's going to be a lot of back and forth. And try to make the ultimate settlement something that the narcissist believes was their idea, if at all possible. It's much easier, we found, if the narcissist at the end of the process walks away thinking, well, that's the deal that I was proposing. And they decided that's the best way to proceed. That's so true because it, it, narcissists will generally never accept your final offer. So going in and saying, this is my best and final offer is not going to work. So you often have to ask for more things you may be willing to let go of in order to obtain a settlement that ultimately is fair, reasonable, and avoids the needs to go to court. But we have those cases where you can't settle them for whatever reason, and we need to go to court. So one of the most important things when dealing with the narcissist is to get court orders as early as possible to take control of the situation. What we refer to as temporary orders, things such as 
who's going to live in the house, who's going to pay the interim bills, what support will be paid, how are we going to deal with parenting time, how are we going to deal with the children, the exchanges of the children, get court orders that outline what's going to happen so that the narcissist has a court order that he must follow. Otherwise, everything is going to be his way or the highway. You need to make a plan and you need to practice that plan so that you are not unraveled in court. It's important to work with your attorney, understand the court process, understand what's going to happen in court. A lot of clients have only seen what goes on on TV shows and they have this aversion uh, to going to court because they think it's going to be a circus. That's not what happens. Good lawyers take control of the courtroom and prepare the client so that when you go to court, it's really a conversation between the client and the judge. Also really important to expose the narcissistic behavior with facts, because sometimes we'll see where a spouse has stalked the other spouse, they've bugged their phones, they've looked through text messages. Exposing the narcissist in court with those facts is important so the judge understands who they're dealing with in this situation. Exposing when they've engaged in manipulative behaviors, such as threatening you, if you don't agree, then there's going to be more problems. In, in a way, it's almost a form of blackmail. And finally, and this is more for the attorneys, that you have to make them respond to your questions on cross-examination. We get this unique opportunity um, compared to settlement negotiations, but in court to be able to cross-examine the narcissistic spouse. And they will often try to charm us too and avoid our questions or become angry and, make, and seem indignant. But very important to maintain eye contact with them, keep after them for their responses and don't let them avoid answering those questions. One of the real problems that we've seen with uh, the no, real narcissistic uh, behavior has to do with weaponizing the children. It's very common that uh, they will try to alienate the child against the other spouse. They will throw blame on the other spouse for everything that has happened in the relationship. It's the other spouse's fault that the relationship has ended. And they try their best to make sure that spouse is punished through the children. So it gets to the point sometimes where we have to actually ask the judge for professional intervention. In other words, we have to ask the court to appoint a psychologist or some mental health professional to evaluate the parties and the children and make a report to the judge as to what's really going on. Why do the children not want to see their mother? Why do the children not want to see their father? Why do the children think the father did this, the mother did that? So it gets to be very complex when dealing with the true narcissist who wants to take revenge on their spouse. And I think to sum it all up, Bob, what we really need to do is when you're dealing with the narcissist, just keep your eye on the end game because in the end, it'll be worth it. And don't be intimidated. That's their goal and that's their plan. Thanks for listening, everyone. We hope you enjoyed this episode of DW Fast Track. For more information, visit our website at www.dickinsonwright.com or check out our social media channels.